It's been a, a long and very successful career for you. Are you uh, too old to rock and roll and too young to die? Um, well, the, um, when I wrote that song, which I think was in 1975, it really was a, a very generous gift to the media because I, uh, I wouldn't say I counted on answering that question for the next 20 years, but certainly for the next few years I expected I would get, you know, hey, are you too old to rock and roll? So, you know, you give people, you give the people, that, you know, it's like giving a dog a, a bone to play with, you know, but you figure after a while he's eaten the bone, he won't, he <laughs> won't, won't be after that particular treat again. But no, that, that one still comes up all the time. And uh, it's, um, it's really best not answered other, by, other than by the fact that we're all still doing this. You know, we left school, all of us, not to become pop stars or rock stars. We didn't quit school to be wearing dark glasses on cloudy days and sitting in hotel lobbies waiting for the limo. We left school to become professional musicians. And uh, my heroes as musicians went were people like Muddy Waters. I mean, they played bars, probably, you know, like this, except smaller. And they probably got paid, you know, 25 bucks. Um, Certainly the time I first started playing in Chicago in 1969, Muddy Waters was still playing the bars then. And we were advised that was not a good place to go. <laughs> Being uh, white, uh, middle-class English art school boys, you didn't want to go to that part of Chicago. But, um, you know, we, 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 we quit school to be musicians. That's what we're doing. It's our, it's our, it's their careers, their jobs. And we're lucky to have jobs we enjoy doing, but it is a job. It is, it is a sense of, of a work ethic. Everybody needs a job. You know, everybody needs a job. It's important to a man, and these days important to a woman too. Everybody needs a job. It's a very fundamental sense of knowing that you're out there bringing home the bacon. And even better if it's one you enjoy, which obviously you do. Yeah, I mean, I suppose I'd, I'd probably enjoy being a 747 pilot and I'd probably enjoy being a professional racing driver, but, uh, you know, on, uh, I get to fly a lot as it is, um, and uh, sometimes some of the taxi drivers in the world treat me to the experience of high-speed automobile manoeuvring, which I'm not particularly fond of, so I'm, I'm happy doing what I do. So right now uh, you would be out in celebration of the... 25th anniversary then of Thick as a Brick? Absolutely not, no, we're just out, just another tour. It's nothing to do with 25th anniversaries or celebrations of anything at all, it's what we do. We wake up in the morning, we go to work, this is what we do. Not celebrating anniversaries or nostalgia or anything like that, we're working musicians, you know. Some nights we're playing to whatever it is here, 3,000 people, some nights it might be 10,000 people, some nights it might be 1,500 people, it depends where it is, what sort of a venue it is. But it's what we do. It's our job. Good job. You'd love my job. So you're glad to be on the road again? You enjoy being on the road? Um, <laughs> yes, of course. It's a, it's a, it's, it has its ups and downs. Uh, it has its downs when you check in a hotel or a motel, as I might more correctly call it, like today, and uh, the rooms aren't ready, and uh, everybody's um, got adjacent smoking rooms. That's not what we signed up for. Um, it has its downs, but you know. On the other hand, we had we had a very nice hotel last couple of nights in Ottawa, and a very pleasant hotel two nights in Quebec. So I can't complain, you know, too much about that. But like anything, it has its ups and downs. So there will be a new release in '98. Yeah, the uh, the uh, I mean, when we finish this this tour, it has about another. Five, five weeks to run. I think we finish up in uh, going down through the Pacific Northwest into uh, the Southwest, you know, finish up in Albuquerque, head back to Europe, play uh, six or seven concerts in Germany, and then that's it for the end, that's it for the year. So uh, we will have done, you know, over 100 shows since the end of May. So we've been pretty much constantly on the road since the end of May. So it's, it's been busy, and we will then be working in the studio from. I guess January and February and hope to have a new studio album out in end of August, beginning of September. So is touring part of your preparation for generally recording a record or are you I think playing new songs now? Or? I, I, I always look at touring as being really more to do with um, 
the, the, the live performance, the verification, if you like, of things that you recorded in the studio, whether it's two years ago or 22 years ago, it's part of... See, I, like a lot of musicians of my nationality and, and age group, started off at art college and we... I mean, I've never spoken to any of the other guys about this, but mainly because I don't really know them, but you know, so many people went to art school in England and, 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 and left to become not artists but musicians. And my theory is that we all probably, if we did sit down and talk about it, would, would find uh, some similar answers as to why we did that. What, what took us to art college in the first place, what took us out of there and into the world of, uh, of uh, rock music. And I, I suspect that it has to do with the more immediate way of presenting your your craft, your art, whatever it is you might call it. It also has to do with the repeat performance of it, because in the painterly sense, you know, you, you, you're working, assuming you're a two-dimensional uh, visual artist, you're working with paint or graphics, or whatever it might be, in, in some way that you're presenting something. But having done it, that's it. It can be reproduced, it can be printed, it can be, uh, you know, it can be a one-off hanging in somebody's home or in a, an art gallery or a museum, or it's maybe something that's printed and tens of thousands of copies are finding their way into people's uh, lives. But it's still a one-off performance. Having done it, you move on. Music isn't like that. Music, you get, you get to write it, you get to record it. That, if you like, is the one-off performance. But then there's other glorious opportunity sets in where you can actually go and relive that performance again and again and again. And you have the opportunity to make very, very small changes according to the way you feel, according to the, uh, perhaps the other people you're working with, perhaps according to the circumstances you find yourself in, in terms of an immediate performing environment. But you get to put a little different spin on it every night. And you don't get to do that if you're a painter. Once you've done it, that's it. So I think that's probably a, a very important aspect to making music as opposed to making uh, uh, visual arts as, as we accept it and understand it to be. Of course, there are performance visual arts, but by and large, you know, what we're talking about is the difference being that you get to play your music a lot of times. And that could be a penalty, it could be a, something you really don't want to do, or in my case, it could be something that, you know, fills you with a lot of, uh, um, you know, positive thoughts about how to, how to make those little variations that make it stay alive. Well, there's songs, of course, that people will want to hear tonight, as myself I would want to hear tonight. Are there, are there songs that you don't want to play anymore, or do you try Yeah, to there's lots of songs I don't want to play anymore. But you won't hear them tonight, or any other night, because I don't play them. Um, no, the, every, everything that we, that we do, and I, I suppose we probably pick most often out of about a hundred songs to, to take, to draw from, in terms of the stuff that we do on stage. And that's out of about 250 songs. So you could say there's 150 songs I wouldn't really care to play live on stage, either because I, in the case of a very few of them, I really don't like the songs that much anymore. You know, they don't feel good to me as pieces I would want to perform live. But more often, just for practical reasons, they're pieces that are um, difficult to present live because of the instrumentation. Um, very often because the instruments I play are you know, things like mandolins and bazookis and stuff that are... I really don't want to drag around on the road with me just for one song, you know. It's, uh, I like to travel light and I like to keep things simple. I take one guitar and two flutes with me, that's it. And uh, so I, 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 I tend to try and get the best out of the, the stuff that uh, is reasonably straightforward and reliable to reproduce every night. And um, I'm sure the other guys feel the same. You know, if they were called upon to play all the different things that are on the records, you know, in terms of uh, all the different percussion things that are on there, all the different sounds and samples and sequences and things that have been used on records since 1982, uh, because that's when the new technology started up. You know, we, we started using sequences and samplers back then. Um, I mean, that's uh, 15 years ago. Um, and it's, it's a lot of stuff to have to drag around with you. It's a lot of, have to, a lot of stuff to have to make sure it works every night. So we, we tend to keep it, you know, practical and reliable, we hope. <laughs> now it's sold out tonight and the people are lining up already, so I think that's a, that's a good indication. 
I guess uh, one last question for you. The well, these, these people probably go to work as well. They understand what it's like. You, know, they, you see, in a, in a strange kind of a way, although we have a reputation of being one of those theatrical kind of art rock bands or prog rock bands from the, the late 60s, early 70s, I think Jeff Sertel is a little different. Jeff Sertel is, uh, is, it has more to do with the world of the Grateful Dead or Bruce Springsteen, you know, in being kind of not show busy kind of guys. Well, there were a couple of years we dressed up a little bit and, you know, it was, it was, thea there was a theatrical moment. Um, 72, 73, maybe 74, it was, you know, a little more theatrical as a presentation, but basically we're just, uh, we're fairly regular guys. It's just, um, um, you know, uh, we, we, we probably have an identification with and from our audiences being not too distant, you know, being kind of reliable, straightforward guys that show up in your neighborhood once every two, three, four years, whatever it might be. And, and it, it breeds that kind of support, that kind of um, loyalty is what it is really from, from the fans and curiosity from the younger fans who perhaps haven't seen us before. I guess then what's the, the greater... A morbid curiosity, you might say. <laughs> we better go and catch them now before they die. <laughs> so what's the greater payoff for you, recording in the studio then or getting out and playing live? What gives you more, more joy? Well, if I had to do only one or the other, I would, I would plump for the live performance. But I don't. I get, I get to do both, so... Uh, you know, the, the studio performance is, is intense and personal because I work alone. I don't, uh, I don't go into other people's recording studios and sit with engineers and producers and tape operators and P-boys. I, um, I work alone doing my bit, you know. I, we rehearse together, we play together as a band, but when it comes to the things I have to do, usually that's after the other guys have done their bit and... I just sit in the, in the room alone and operate the equipment, and, and, and it's a very personal. It's um, you know, it, it's rather like being a painter. You know, you're just really just just you working with your canvas alone in a studio. It's a, it is a nice, private and very intense um, experience, and hopefully, hopefully one that doesn't drag on as long as it might otherwise do if I if I was working with a whole bunch of other people because um, you know, I can work very quickly alone. So I know exactly what I'm trying to do and uh, can operate the equipment you know much faster than somebody else could in terms of saying I think I'll just try that one again you know by the time they've rewound the tape or found the place I'm already there doing the next take you know so it's it's, it's quicker doing it that way yeah. and with a little bit of luck there's only two takes anyway <laughs> where does fish farming fall into that um, it doesn't really fall into it at all because I'm you know for 19 Coming up for 20 years now, I've been involved in aquaculture and fish processing, and um, every day 400 people or so go to work in my fish farms and factories in Scotland. I mean, it's mainly in factories doing fish processing. You know, it's not so much people working on the farms, but um, I mean, that's a business that is run by professionals that uh, run the business. It's uh, it's not it's not something I do every day. I mean, I'm, if I spend two days a month with anything to do with that side of it, that would be a a busy month. I'm most of the time doing, you know, what you see me doing here, sitting around just <laughs> waiting for showtime. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. Thank you.